The problem in today's world is that everywhere we are told that healthy foods are boring, they're unsatiating, they're disgusting. And when we think of eating healthy, we think of deprivation and restriction, right? And when we eat unhealthy, we think of it being sexy and indulgent and satisfying and so delicious. And we need to change the thinking behind that so that we understand and feel innately that eating healthy is actually the reward. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. I'm Dr. Ashley, and today we are going to dive into a topic that will not just make or break your weight loss, but pretty much impact every aspect of your life, and that is your mindset. I talk about mindset a lot, and at PhD, where we help people drop weight and keep it off, I always say that 80% of any life change, which weight loss definitely is categorized in, comes from the mind, you know, the mental, emotional habits, behavior. So today I want to talk about that mindset and how it really influences weight loss and this long-term success. I love meditation and it's an important practice in my life and, and I recommend it to everybody because of the positive impact it has had on my life. And one meditation that I've done many times, it's an abundance meditation done by Bob Proctor. I, I bet you could even just look it up on YouTube and find it. And he says, if you can hold it in your head, you can hold it in your hand. And I just love that, right? It, it's about your belief in yourself, the faith, confidence, and, and belief that you've got. And if you can visualize it and picture it, if you don't know about me, I was a professional ballet dancer before I got into the field of nutrition. And I physically wasn't meant for the field. I was injured all the time. I always under ate and over exercised and was always told that I was fat, even though I counted calories like an expert bookkeeper. And um, despite that, I had a fairly successful career and I, I danced with professional companies all across the nation and was selected to perform in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. I attribute that success to my grit and perseverance and commitment toward a, a big time goal, but also my ability to visualize and believe in myself that I could actually achieve and overcome. And so if I failed at one attempt, I would learn how to use it and leverage it and, and overcome it. There's a lot of research that comes from the field of growth mindset versus fixed mindset and belief and how our thoughts really impact our success. There was a study done by Dr. Crum out of Harvard, and she looked at the impact. I think this is interesting because I had to do with nutrition specifically, but the impact of the mindset around calorie loads of a milkshake. So what she did was she got, uh, she worked with the hospital and she worked with the patients in the hospital. And she told one group that they were going to have this really delicious, indulgent, high calorie treat of a milkshake. And then she told the second group that they were going to have this healthy shake that was 300 calories, moderate fat, and, you know, was, was there for health purpose. And everyone actually got the same milkshake and it was about 350 calories, didn't have a ton of fat in it. It was decently healthy. And so she measured their satisfaction and how full that they felt. And you could uh, believe that the one that was told they were eating the indulgent, delicious shake felt much more satisfied and full than the ones who believed they were eating the lower calorie shake. The interesting thing is they actually measured what was happening physiologically in these patients' bodies. And they measured ghrelin. And ghrelin is your hunger hormone. So if you have elevated ghrelin levels, you're going to be more hungry. And if you have lower ghrelin levels, you're going to be more full. And the wild thing about this is that the people who thought they were eating the 600 calorie shake had lower ghrelin levels. So they actually physiologically were less hungry than the ones who thought that they had the moderate calorie shake. Isn't that wild? So the hormones in their body change, not just their beliefs in their mind, but the response that their body had hormonally, metabolically, chemically shifted as a result. She did another study looking at a group of employees who worked and cleaned at a hotel. You know, those people are up and down the stairs. They're bending over, changing sheets, doing all these different things. And they didn't think of themselves as being healthy or active. And so they took two groups again and they told one group of the employees, hey, you know, what you do is hard and you are really physically active and this is really great for your heart and it's good for your muscles and here are all the benefits. 
And then they had the other group where they didn't tell them anything. And this is the control group. Well, after a period of time, they measured the physiology of the hotel employees and the ones who were told that they were exercising a lot and doing a lot of healthy things actually had biomarkers shift in a positive direction. So their blood pressure dropped, their muscle mass increased, they were happier, they felt healthier, they ate healthier foods compared to the control group that wasn't told anything. So this is just summarizing to you that your beliefs impact your physical well-being. Another study came out looking at two groups of weightlifters, and they told both groups that they were on steroids, but they actually gave one a placebo, so one a pill that was nothing, and the other they gave the steroids, and you won't believe the results. The results show that both groups had the same amount of lean mass muscle gains. So the non-steroid taking group thought they were taking steroids and had the same muscle gains as the group that was actually taking steroids. So all that really matters is what you believe because that impacts your physiology. Earlier this year, I decided to challenge myself physically because I think it's always important that you challenge yourself. You always have a goal where there's like a 50% chance of failure because that's how you grow, you level up, you learn. And so I told myself that I was going to do 10 unassisted pull-ups and I've never been able to do more than two pull-ups in my life. And my mom always says, like, you're never going to be able to do a pull-up. She doesn't mean it in a mean way. But uh, she, she's like, genetically, we're just not created in a way that we can do pull-ups. She's like, I tried. I could never do it. You're never going to be able to do it. It's just something that us, we just don't do. And I'm like, well, I want to be able to do a pull-up. I should be able to. Like, I'm pretty darn fit. I work out. I was a, a dancer. Like, come on here. Let's do this. Like, I'm going to challenge myself because there's a 50% chance of failure here. So I got a trainer. I had someone help me collapse time and tell me exactly what to do. And I followed it to a T, but I still wasn't keeping up. Like, I gave myself 90 days and halfway in, I still could only do probably four. And like, oh my gosh, I'm falling behind. And then uh, 30 days out, I'm like, oh my gosh, I could only do six. What am I going to do? I cannot. And I posted this on Instagram. Like I couldn't let Instagram down. And so I did two pull-ups in a row because that's what I could do. And then I had my husband, Doug, who's the techie one, do a video where he repeated me doing it 10 times in a row. So it looked like I was doing 10 unassisted effortless pull-ups. And I studied that and I closed my eyes and I visualized it and I felt what it would feel like as if I could do those 10. Like I celebrated in my mind, I felt the emotions of accomplishing 10 unassisted pull-ups and like what my mom would say, what I would feel like, all of that. And so I watched it and watched it and you can go to my Instagram, Dr. Underscore Ashley Lucas, if you need to see it, just to believe it. And I legit did 10 unassisted pull-ups within 90 days. And I believe that it was my thoughts and my visualization that I could do it and feeling what it felt like as if it was already accomplished that allowed me to do the 10 pull-ups. I mean, the actions and the behaviors of working out and doing that, that was helpful as well, but I wouldn't have been able to accomplish it had I had a fixed mindset. So what I'm getting at is that there is a significant influence of your thoughts and beliefs on your total life experience. They shape your physiological responses, your health outcomes, your cognitive ability, your resiliency, and even in response to how you eat and what you eat, your beliefs shape your experiences. Your thoughts program your subconscious, and that is a huge thing to be able to understand and accept as truth. So the steps to allow this mindset to work for you is to number one, embrace a growth mindset over a fixed mindset. And a growth mindset is the belief that your abilities, your qualities can be adapted and developed through dedication and effort over time. A fixed mindset is that your abilities are fixed traits, that no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to change them. So if I had a fixed mindset, I would be like, oh, yeah, that's true. I'm never going to be able to do a pull up. I might as well not even try. Or even if I do try, I'm probably never going to get to 10. And I probably would have not gotten to 10 if I had that mindset. So the first step is to recognize if you do have a growth or a fixed mindset and ask yourself, what are your core beliefs? Do you believe you can grow and change or do you believe everything is stagnant and fixed and stuck the way you are? Embrace the power of yet to help yourself establish this growth mindset. So I can't do this versus I can't do this yet. Do you see the difference? I can't drop this weight because I've not been able to do it in the past or I 
uh, you know, I can't drop this weight yet, even though I haven't been able to do it in the past. So that allows you to be in this idea that you haven't mastered it in the present moment, but in the future, mastery is still possible. And that's all you need. You need a belief in the future. Recognize your fixed mindset thoughts. So listen to your inner dialogue. For example, I'll never be able to drop this weight. You need to challenge and replace that story. That is not a true story. Think about the words that you use because the words you use really program the computer that is your brain. So for example, how will I ever drop this weight? Or how will I drop this weight? See the difference of those two words. How will I ever drop this weight? Seems very down and negative in a low vibratory state versus how will I drop this weight? Like that's more positive and it gets you think about the what ifs and it brings curiosity into it. So you want to bring curiosity into the movement and the direction that you're going that might seem a little bit scary, that might trend more toward a fixed mindset where you really need to have this growth mindset. View failures as learning opportunities. Don't see failures as a personal reflection of abilities. Uh, but reframe as an opportunity for growth. And this is what I had to do as a dancer, right? I, I leverage those setbacks to push me forward, maybe even faster in the future. And so setbacks, you know, is a valuable lesson. It's a call it a setback or a, an alleged failure, but really that is priming us and giving us what we need to be able to move forward in the future to see success. Think about what opportunity is here for me to overcome. Think about if you have dropped weight, for example, in the past and you're going to get started, you know you want to so bad, but you're held back into your past failures. I, I want you to think, what opportunity is here now for me to overcome? What can I learn from the past so that I'm more successful this time? You only repeat your past if you live there. So changing those stories and beliefs and adopting this growth mindset is really important. Emphasize effort and grit and perseverance not focusing rather on success in an instance. As a parent these days, we're encouraged to focus on our kids' effort, right? So instead of saying, oh my gosh, you're so great at that, we're supposed to say it's still a challenge for me, but wow, look how hard you tried. You tried, that was so amazing. Good job for trying. Well, we want to do the same thing for us. And it's really hard because we want to just be great in an instance. And in today's society with social media, we see these successful people and it looks like they've just gotten their success in an instant where they worked for decades to achieve the success that they've gleaned. So recognizing that for yourself is that it doesn't have to happen in an instant. And even if you have failed in the past, you're starting again, you've relapsed, who cares? And nothing matters as long as you get back up on the horse and you try again. I have clients also all the time who are excited to enter into maintenance. So at PhD, what we do is we create customized meal plans and we guide you on exactly what, when, and how much to eat. So our clients know exactly what to do. We take out all of the guesswork and then we actually provide about 85% of the food and there's no cost associated with the food. You don't have to use the food if you don't want to, but it is here for you as a tool and it could cover breakfast, most of your lunch, most of your snacks throughout the day, and then the dinner meals on your own so that you become an expert at one meal at a time. And that's your responsibility, but we help you and guide you. And it's like little baby steps where you become an expert at dinner. And then we release our lunch foods and you practice lunch and then breakfast. And so there's a gradual release of our foods should you choose to use them so that you're totally self-sufficient at the end and understand what you need to do and then once you get there, maintenance is free. The support is free. We're always by your side. We never abandon you. And you've always got us as a resource and, and support team. So our clients are always really excited about entering to maintenance. Like, oh my gosh. And the weight loss phase, though, is easy and it's simple. And you're not hungry and you don't have cravings. And we give you the gosh darn food. And it's so easy and people are always rushed for the next thing. And I always tell them, don't don't be rushed because honestly, maintenance isn't much different. Enjoy the process. Find joy in the process. Be in joy of the process is the key for everything in life, really. And oftentimes we just try to rush to the end. So if you are dropping weight right now and you're in a great program that provides you all the support you need, enjoy that part of the process because honestly, it might be easier than the maintenance aspect that you're rushing to get to. 
And then next is to seek out challenges. Do hard things. Don't be afraid of doing hard things like that pull-up test for me. It's always important to have one thing out there where you've got a 50% chance of failure. And the beauty and the magic comes in the challenge. The confidence that you get comes from doing something hard. When you've done something hard, you start to gain the integrity and you start to trust yourself and have confidence within yourself. And that is the key to long-term success. So I urge you to ask yourself, when was the last time you've done something hard? And is it time maybe right now to step up and into something that's going to challenge you? The next thing is to cultivate a love for learning. Have a passion and curiosity for learning something new. Be obsessed with growth. I did a show on the traits of people who are successful with weight loss. And one is that they are obsessed with continuing to grow themselves, to learn. They're committed to their well-being. And that's what you need to be. Remember that your environment is always stronger than your willpower. If you're dropping weight, for example, it's always easier if you are with a spouse or a partner and they do it with you. So I always encourage when we have people at PhD for the partners, the spouses, to do it with one another because then your environment is going to be more supportive of the direction that you're heading. And then just making sure that your community is there to influence and support and encourage and to reinforce your growth-oriented behaviors, especially if these behaviors are new to you. It's going to be really hard if your community and your friends push you to drink, for example, rather than encourage you to refrain if that's one of your goals associated with growth. And then stack wins and celebrate and acknowledge those wins. I know as a type A personality, I expect those wins. Those are my standards. And I'll have a win and then just move on and be like, okay, what's the next one? And I don't stop and be present with that win. And if you are the same way, I encourage you to stack those wins and then celebrate and acknowledge and be proud of yourselves for the wins, you know, especially when it comes to food. For the last few minutes, I want to dive into the really most important aspect associated with this mindset and how you view food. So the ticket to success here is to eat healthy food, but do so in a mindset of enjoyment, indulgement, and satisfaction. The problem in today's world is that everywhere we are told that healthy foods are boring, they're unsatiating, they're disgusting. And when we think of eating healthy, we think of deprivation and restriction, right? And when we eat unhealthy, we think of it being sexy and indulgent and satisfying and so delicious and we need to change the thinking behind that so that we understand and feel innately that eating healthy is actually the reward. Eating healthy is indulgement. So remember that your physiology from those studies that I shared with you early on are impacted by your thoughts. So the best mindset for weight loss specifically is one where you think and you feel you believe that you're getting enough. So one more time, the best mindset for weight loss is one where you think you feel and believe that you are getting enough. Because if you believe that, then your physiology will change to support that notion. So for example, you could tell yourself, I choose to eat this food because it makes me feel good. It makes me satisfied. It is so delicious and it just fills me and gives me exactly what I need. So you could say, I choose to eat this salad and steak for that reason or whatever. Fill in the blank with whatever food is actually healthy and supportive of your goals. Remember that if you think something is nutrient-dense, fulfilling, and satisfying, then it's going to decrease your hunger hormones. That ghrelin hormone is going to decrease, and that leptin full hormone is going to increase. So, you know, with me, as a, I was a professional ballet dancer, and I always struggled with my weight, like I shared. And I was always eating low-calorie, and I was in a constant mindset of restraint, and I never felt like I was doing enough exercise. I would dance probably, I would train and perform maybe six to eight hours a day, about six days a week. And I would then afterwards go to the gym and get on the elliptical machine, which is like if I had known what I know now, I wouldn't have done any of that because it was too much. But if I had chosen the type of exercise, I would have lifted weights because that's what all of us need to be doing. So for you as well, if you're going to choose one type of activity, I really encourage you to lift something heavy, not too heavy that you injure yourself, but something that overloads the muscle because we need to maintain our muscle mass. But 
Anyway, for me, I was always on the elliptical machine thinking I just needed to burn more calories. It was never enough. I understand now that that was a detrimental mindset. And even if I was getting enough, my beliefs were supporting a physiology that didn't encourage me being satiated and full and getting the benefits of the exercise that I would have otherwise. The last tip that I have for you on this type of mindset associated with food and nutrition is to not utilize a tracker for your food. Now, let me clarify this. Writing down on a food journal on a piece of paper, simple paper, real paper and a pen, what you've eaten throughout the day and when is very helpful. And we have our clients at PhD do this for two reasons. One, to hold them accountable and to learn what they're doing but also for us so that if we don't see someone drop weight each week, then we can go in and tweak things and figure out what we need to change so that they can see continued success. But mainly the reason that I don't like trackers that count calories and your macros, like your grams of carbs and protein and fat, is because it messes with your brain. We are not driven by calculators and computers. Uh, Now you know that what you believe and your thoughts really impact your physiology. So let's say you're using MyFitnessPal, for example, and you put in all the foods that you've eaten through the day and it calculates every single calorie and gram of carbs, protein, and fat. And then let's say you enter in how long you were on the elliptical machine or you went for a walk or spin class. It puts in all your calories. And at the end of the day, you see this red deficit number of calories. Let's say it's negative 600 calories. And you think, oh my gosh, negative 600 calories and now all these thoughts start to brew. You're not listening to your body, by the way, that says you're totally satisfied. You're not hungry at all and you could go to bed. But instead you're thinking, oh my gosh, negative 600 calories, I could be shutting down my metabolism, which is just a myth, but we've heard it and a lot of us believe it. And so there's a little bit of fear and stress that picks up or, oh my gosh, 600 calories. I'm not letting those go to waste. Let me go to the pantry and pick out what I'm going to eat. Meanwhile, you're not hungry and your body doesn't need it at all. So what you want to be able to do is listen to your body and understand when it's hungry and when it's full and be able to trust those sensations in your body, which I promise you, you can get to. It is possible even if you aren't there right now. So there is hope of change. And those trackers just really drive more of a type of disordered eating rather than just being one with your body and listening to those sensations. And now we know that those feelings of having the deficit or maybe overeating with calories could lead to you feeling full of shame. And we know that shame isn't good for our mindset or metabolism and physiology. Here's an example. I used to use the Aura Ring, and the Aura Ring is a great tracker for sleep. And my husband, he still uses it because he's very data-driven. So I understand there are many different perceptions out there. I'm just sharing mine with you. And I would stick that Aura Ring on there, and I would wake up, and it would say bright red, or maybe it's not red, yellow. Your sleep score was terrible. And I'd be like, oh, my gosh, I didn't get REM sleep. I just got this much deep sleep. My day is going to be terrible. I'm so tired. And it was just this number telling me that I should be tired. Then as a result of my thoughts, my physiology supported that. And I felt really terrible, tired, and foggy-headed. Whereas if I don't wear that freaking tracker, then I can have a poor night's sleep. And I wake up and I can listen to my body. And uh, many times I feel really great. Like, for example, I just traveled from Costa Rica yesterday. And I actually haven't slept in a night because... I traveled throughout the night and just got home right before doing this show. And if I had looked at my aura ring, it would tell me that I couldn't function or speak clearly. So if I'm not speaking (laughs) perfectly clearly, that could be why. But I mean, decent, right? I'm having a great day. I'm being productive. I'm able to serve people. And if I had that tracker on there, it would have totally ruined my day. And I probably wouldn't be here sharing this important message with you. So... The moral of the story is that it's a match between your mindset and your behaviors. They have to go together. And as a result of having this growth mindset and these positive behaviors, you can make transformative and long-lasting, sustainable change in your life. So guys, I hope you got great value from this episode. If you are watching this on YouTube, please leave a comment, any feedback below, and subscribe to the channel. If you are listening to this on a podcast platform, please subscribe and leave a review. And remember that you've got to step up to make the change. Lead with your heart, train your mind, and don't negotiate with your body. 
See you on the next episode. Thank you.